Hi there, folks. My name's Ron Rogers, and this is the story of the XF-85 Goblin, the smallest fighter ever built. It was 15 feet long, 21 inches, wingtip to wingtip, and the wingtips folded. And, um, yeah, kind of an interesting aircraft. This was proposed right after World War II, because, you see, the, the, the B-17s, as, as you, you may or may not know, they had a real issue with limited fighter support. The uh, bombers would be getting into Germany, and they finally got some long-range P-51s and, uh, B, uh, and, and uh, P-47s that were able to go with the uh, bombers. But the Luftwaffe was a very strong fighting force, fighter force, and the uh, bombers needed the uh, fighter escorts from the U.S. So fighter escorts for bombers was quite an issue. And with the new bombers coming out, the B-29s and the B-36s, they were having three to five times the range. So the whole issue of uh, fighter escort was getting to be an interesting problem. Now, like I said, you may never have heard of the XF-85 Goblin. I actually ran into this uh, when I was a college student back in the, uh, the late 60s at a uh, museum just north of Offutt Air Force Base. It's setting out there uh, in the open air next to a B-36, and I'm looking at this thing and wondering, what the heck is that? Well, if you haven't heard of the XF-85 Goblin, and uh, James Smith McDonald of McDonald Doug of McDonald at the time, uh, this is before McDonald Douglas, but McDonald at the time, uh, b was very uh, superstitious and believed in the spirit world, and uh, he chose the name of Goblin. Okay, that's where that came from. Now, if you haven't heard of this fighter, you most likely never heard of the test pilot there on the left, uh, McDonald uh, test pilot Edwin Forsman Schlock. Nope, you never heard of test pilot Schlock, most likely. You know, not all test pilot jobs are the same. Not all are uh, fantastic, you know, uh, I won't say this wasn't cutting-edge technology because it was probably beyond cutting-edge technology because there were a lot of problems with this program. This, this, you know, if you're a test pilot, and he was the only one, Schlock was the only one who ever flew the uh, the Goblins. Only two of them were produced, and the, the program was uh, canceled uh, fairly quickly. But McDonnell Douglas was a new company. They were the only ones who even bid on, on this aircraft. And uh, it started out with an earlier designation, a, um, a P-27, I believe it was, and, and later morphed into the 85. But uh, McDonald D Douglas was a, a McDonald. I keep, it, it's hard for me not to say McDonald Douglas. Uh, McDonald's was the only ones who even bid on this thing. And uh, yeah, uh, kind, of a, kind of an interesting uh, uh, aircraft to be assigned to as a test pilot. I'm not sure I'd have been overly excited, and uh, he doesn't necessarily look overly excited excited and the uh, uh, the ground sport guy there probably a mechanic he's got an expression on his face it almost looks like are you really going to fly this thing now the whole idea is up to four of these goblins would be carried in internally on a b-36 they had a trapeze here um uh, fighter con uh, trapeze it was called that was for uh, fighter conveyance to bring the fighters with you and supposedly it would hold four of these in the in the bay and there were several b-36s set aside uh, to be modified to carry the goblins but initially they did the flight testing and you know you guys who are and gals out there who are sharp you're going that that's not a b-36 no they use b-29s uh, for the program and uh, they they had uh, quite an interesting uh, time the uh, the first flight uh, with test pilot Schlock was conducted on uh, 23 August of 48 now this is the first free flight they did uh, a number of captive carries just to determine if the aircraft uh, could be carried uh, under the bomber and they could successfully fly and on a few of these they actually extended the um, uh, goblin into the airstream uh, so the pilot could kind of play with it a little bit kind of figure out how it handled and things like that and do some various tests but it was not uh, the the B-29 was not big enough to actually pull this thing internally, so it was always uh, carried captively. 
Now, um, the, uh, the the program had a bunch of interesting uh, interesting events. There were uh, seven test flights of free flights, and only three were able to successfully dock. They ran into quite a bit of problems, and you know the the idea supposedly was there were going to be some B thirty sixes that would have these fighters. They would go ahead in an attack on uh, you know supposedly Russia. This was the, uh, the the whole nuclear deterrence thing at the time, uh, and they'd have some B thirty sixes that would go in early, launch a whole bunch of these fighters, and they would engage uh, the the enemy was MiG seventeens and. Uh, this airplane uh, didn't have a lot of uh, a great performance to engage a MiG-17. MiG-17. Now you may be saying, wait a minute, I, I thought I heard something about uh, this concept being used before. And, and yes, it was. In the 30s, uh, the, the Navy had a, a bunch of airships, and there was the USS Los Angeles, the Arkan, and the Macon, and all of these uh dirigibles had the ability to carry uh, fighters. A Curtis F-9C Sparrowhawk uh, was attached, and uh, these were actually brought into the uh, bottom of the dirigible in a hangar area, and it could carry up to uh, about five of these things, uh, single-seat uh, pursuit aircraft. And uh, the, uh, the U.S. course wasn't the only one. Now here on the left is a picture of a SOP with 2F1 camel secured under the British uh, Her Majesty's Airship 23R. And on the right is a Curtis F9C Sparrowhawk. And you notice the um, uh, elaborate and extensive uh, trestle type of structure they have for um, attaching these aircraft. And, and the, the program wasn't without limited success. And there was also Project TomTom, Tom, where they used a Boeing B-50, and they attached two Republic F-84 Thunderjet fighters to the wingtips. And here, basically, the, um, the bomber would carry these two fighters into enemy territory where they could engage the enemy. Now, it was a different time back in the 50s and the 60s, and I was at a Society of Experimental Test Pilot uh, Symposium, the National Symposium, and there was a gentleman that uh, shared the room uh, next to us, and I would see him in the morning going down to the uh, the uh, presentations, and uh, we'd, my wife and I would say hi to him. And Saturday um, during the symposium, they have you know that uh, they they talk about all the current programs during the week, but on Saturdays it's kind of the historical program time. And the, uh, the test pilot that was next to me was the guy who was involved in the rocket launch steady state of the F-100s. And this was another one of these kind of wild and crazy programs that existed back in these this time. It seems like things are a little more uh, tame now, if you will. But uh, he made the comment, uh, and, and there were some very interesting malfunctions of this uh, um set up and uh, he made the kind of the laughing comment that well fighter pilots were a lot uh, fighter pilots and test pilots were a lot cheaper back then so they could afford to do all these really crazy high risk programs and there were plenty of test pilots who willingly signed on to them all right here is the cockpit of the uh, the goblin there and it you, you got fairly simplistic uh, instrumentation there um, you know, that, that little knob in the center looks like probably a radio uh, frequency selector. And uh, you've got an altimeter, an airspeed, and uh, probably a G-meter. But it, it is a pretty uh, simple uh, cockpit. I don't even see uh, an attitude indicator. Now, uh, the idea was these fighters would be carried, and they would only need a 30-minute combat range because they wouldn't have to waste fuel getting up to altitude to engage the enemy. And a lot of the test flights were done uh, from 20,000 feet. Uh, but supposedly the B-36 were going to be able to carry these aircraft up to 48,200 feet. And then it would drop them to attack uh, any enemy fighters that came up to engage the B-36s. And there is another uh, picture of the cockpit of the uh, the goblin there the uh, uh, 
P or Phi. They've just gone from pursuit designation to F designation, the uh, F-85 Goblin. Now, here is a little bit better picture of it, and uh, they, uh, they had a lot of trouble um, coming up under the bombers. There was a lot of disturbed airflow, and the, and the test pilot, um, Schlock, had a lot of trouble uh, engaging uh, the trapeze mechanism. Now, you see that, that big hook up there. Um, he actually had an ejection seat with a cord. It, they called it a cordite ejection seat, which is a kind of an explosive cable. Uh, so it was probably like the uh, the shells that they used on the T-37 uh, as a method of getting out. They weren't really, um, although I guess cordite could burn like a rocket, uh, but uh, I'm not really familiar uh, with this type of seat. But it sounds pretty perimeter, but you would want to get that hook out of the way uh, before you bailed out because it looked like you might have a little canopy uh, interference there, you know, when you ejected. So that, that hook, um, of course, would be in the way. So it would lay down to the, uh, the side of the, the fighter there. Okay, now the uh, first free flight was conducted, as I mentioned, on 23 August of 1948. And... Uh, Test pilot Schlock had a lot of trouble engaging uh, the uh, trapeze there with the hook. Uh, it looks like he's a fair distance below the bomber, but there was a lot of disturbed airfoil around, uh, disturbed airflow around the bomber, which made it very difficult uh, to try to engage that hook. And Schlock made uh, three unsuccessful attempts uh, to engage uh, the hook. And on the fourth one, he actually uh, ended up uh, hitting the trapeze, damaging the can canopy to the extent that it separated from the aircraft. His helmet and mask also separated, and um, he's now not in a very good position, and he's forced to make an emergency landing. Now, the whole idea on this was the, uh, the B-36 would uh, launch these aircraft and recover these aircraft. I guess you really wanted to protect your bomber because if it got shot down and you didn't have anybody to recover you, you were going to be in a world of hurt. But the idea was it would carry four of these things, it would launch and uh, recover them. So uh, to save weight, and uh, since this was very small anyway, it had a very low fuel load, but to save weight, uh, it didn't have any landing gear. Well, uh, with the unsuccessful docking attempts, like I said, there were seven flights. Only three of them actually were successful in engaging uh, the trapeze. So they were forced to make emergency landings. They had a steel belly skid, so they, they could uh, uh, skid it to a stop on the, uh, the lake bed down there at Muroc, later become Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, but they had a number of those landings where they just, uh, um, you know, uh, skidded to a stop on its belly. And here's another picture of the trapeze mechanism from a slightly different angle. They also attempted uh, this concept with a uh, Republic F-84E uh, engaging in the uh, trapeze, but uh, this program just wasn't going to fill the uh, requirements because the, uh, the wing tips on the F-84 did not fold and they weren't going to be able to bring it inside the aircraft, so the aircraft would have to be suspended like this for an entire uh, mission, and you can imagine how uncomfortable that would be for the pilot setting in there the, the entire mission. And here is a picture of the uh, goblin with the wings folded uh, in a, uh, a mock-up ground handling type of facility here where it would be able to be drawn up into the bomb bay of the, uh, the B-36. And of course on the right is a picture of it with the, uh, the wings extended. So here is the XF-85 goblin. And as you can probably readily Note, if you are a keen observer, uh, it carries a crew of one. Uh, the aircraft is 14 feet 10 inches long. It has a wingspan of 21 feet 1 inch, a height of 8 feet 3 inches, a wing area of 90 square feet. Uh, it has a maximum takeoff weight of 5,600 pounds, and it has a uh, power plant of a Westinghouse XJ34-WE-22 turbojet engine that developed 3,000 pounds of thrust. 
The maximum speed uh, was listed at 650 miles per hour, and it had endurance range of 1 hour and 20 minutes, although the combat range, that's where you're at a lot of high power, was essentially going to be 30 minutes, which, of course, in fighter parlance, uh, you know, engaging the enemy goes very quickly, uh, but you would need 30 minutes uh, to get to the situation where you would engage him. It had a service ceiling of 48,000 feet and uh, a rate of climb uh, listed as 12,500 feet per minute, which is reasonably reasonably uh, interesting, and a thrust weight ratio of 0.66. Okay, well, the, the aircraft doesn't weigh much, so you don't need much of an engine to really get you moving. Well, the program was started in 48 with the uh, the first flights, and it was ended a year later. It became uh, quickly obvious that this aircraft was not going to be functional, and uh, it was not going to fill the bill, and uh, they would have to resort to other methods of protecting the bombers, because carrying the fighters like this was not going to be a viable program. And uh, McDonald, test pilot Schlock, uh, did not go down in uh, fame and glory as the the first and only pilot of the XF-84 Goblin. But like I said, I wanted I wanted to talk about this because I I stumbled onto this thing at the museum. Uh, one of these is at Wright Patterson Air Force Base because they get a lot of the interesting aircraft there, a lot of the test aircraft. And the other one, of course, is the uh, uh, SAC Museum, uh, just uh, north of. Um, um, uh, Omaha there, I think it's in Bellevue, uh, Nebraska, where the museum is. But uh, I stumbled across that in the late uh, 60s and kind of looked at it and go, what the heck is this thing? So I always thought this was an interesting aircraft. Um, hey, thanks for watching.